Hello everybody and welcome to what is sure to be a very interesting few weeks here at WrestlingEpicenter.com as we are going to do an interview themed tribute to the Global Wrestling Federation. Now a few nights ago I was sitting down watching some of the old Global Wrestling Federation footage that I have on video and I noticed the date on it said 1991. And it dawned on me, oh my god, it's been 20 years since the Global Wrestling Federation's Supercard made its debut over on the ESPN network. And I thought, you know what, no other show is going to do a tribute to this. And our show has always been about the fans, by the fans, and it's always been kind of what I wanted to hear and see on the website and hear on a radio show. And you know what, this is something that I would enjoy, and whether or not anybody else on the planet will enjoy it or not, it's a tribute that I want to give to the wrestling community. So if you were a fan of the Global Wrestling Federation, I salute you, and the next few weeks of interviews is for you. Now our first interview is with the man who actually helped kick off the program of Supercard alongside Scott Hudson and Joe Pettisino, and that is Mr. Craig Johnson, real name John Horton. And John joins us in just a few moments. Again, welcome to WrestlingEpicenter.com and our very special tribute to the Global Wrestling Federation. Welcome back, everyone, to the Global Wrestling Federation Tribute Show. It's been almost 20 years since Supercard took the air on the ESPN network. And joining us is the gentleman who actually kicked off that show alongside Joe Pettisino and Scott Hudson. And that is the one and only Craig Johnson, John Horton. Are you on the, sh are you on the line with us, Mr. Johnson? I am. Well, I haven't been called that in almost 20 years. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am on the line with you from... Uh, Ballard, Washington, which is just outside of Seattle, where they're celebrating Norwegian Constitution Day. Norwegian Constitution Day. Yes, they are. Wow. They, the largest parade uh, that they have in Seattle all year. Really? With, with a lot of hip hip hurrah going on. Now, in Seattle, there's always rain on the parade, though, right? Well, it's actually the first sunny day that we've had in a couple of weeks. Oh really? And believe believe me, it's a, it's a joy to have a sun here. Our our summer usually lasts about a day, <laughs> but uh, we we actually have some sun today. It's very nice. Very cool, very cool, and you know it's great to have you on the show. It kind of dawned on me a few weeks ago that it's been 20 years since the debut of Global, and you know me being a 10 year old kid at the time, it was the greatest thing ever to have daily wrestling <laughs> on the ESPN network, and uh, you know I looked you up and found you on Facebook, and I'm glad I did, and. Again, welcome to the show, and I guess the first question I have to ask you is, you know, looking back, can you believe it's been 20 years since the Supercard was on the air? Well, considering I turned 48 last Thursday, thank you for making me feel old. Um, <laughs> it seems like it was just a couple of years ago, quite frankly. Um, it is absolutely amazing to think that it's been 20 years. Uh, to see... Uh, Obviously, some of the guys that, that came through our territory or came through our promotion uh, have obviously retired. But, you, you know, you, you think of some of, the, some of the people that are still around and still working. Uh, Cactus Jack, uh, uh, Sean Waltman is still out there, although he's been through his highs and lows. Jerry Lynn, uh, you know, it's just absolutely amazing to see those guys still out there in the spotlight, and we saw them when they were much, much younger. Right. Uh, and to see, you know, I even before Global, I had the chance to work with a, a long-haired blonde named Stunning Steve Austin. Over in the USWA. And, yeah, and, and to see him uh, hosting Tough Enough and just seeing him sitting in that, that boardroom chair, knowing that I actually worked with him as a, as a young kid, uh, it's just it's amazing how we've all grown up and we've all uh, matured in in different ways and uh, it, it it just it, it makes you feel older but makes you realize that uh, we've all been lucky to live pretty darn full lives and doing what we wanted to do. Exactly, and and wrestling wasn't necessarily your thing. It wasn't going to be what you were 
remembered for, and I don't think that in some circles it is, but in the wrestling world, you are remembered for the Global Wrestling Federation and, to some degree, the USWA. And How did you end up in our crazy business when you have a legitimate sports calling background? It was supposed to be a summertime fill-in job that I was going to have for two weeks. Um, (laughs) Max Andrews was the syndicator of a Washington Redskins show that I was producing. And I once told him that if Mark Lawrence ever went on vacation, I would love to come in and and just work the two weeks that he was gone or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get a phone call from him saying, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that because he's decided to retire, and we need an announcer to come in and basically work the show until we can find a replacement. Wow. So my summer was open. I was doing George Washington University basketball, and uh, I had a summertime that was open. So I pretty much uh, I just bought a house in, in Washington, D.C., uh, but I still had my condominium in Dallas, Texas, because that's where I had gone to school. So I, I moved out into my condominium and uh, and went in for my audition, which was actually the first USWA show I did. They didn't they didn't have time to they didn't have time to put me through any screen test or anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jerry Jarrett talked to me, said, "How much do you know about our promotion?" And I said. I can tell you who your tag team champions are. I can tell you what your storylines are. Um, uh, I've actually kept up with it through uh, uh, reading newsletters because I am a fan. Uh, I'm not a hardcore fan, but I am a fan. And uh, and I do know what's been going on in your storyline. So I think I can be uh, pretty knowledgeable. And But the one thing that I will – tell you jerry is that i would rather do this like a sports announcer would as opposed to a wrestling announcer i don't want to come out here and try to hype things uh all the time i want to call this how it was is a sporting event and he said well that sounds interesting go for it i don't know you from adam so just go ahead and go for it (laughs) so that's actually very fascinating because we've talked on the show a lot about how we feel wrestling would benefit from having more of a sports logic and a sports edge to it. Is that something that you think is missing in today's wrestling product, where it's just it seems like they want to move as far away from anything sports-related as possible? Well, if you're asking if I like the Michael Cole angle and does it make me uh, ill, uh, I shake my head every time I, I hear him talk. Um, <laughs> When we went into the glow, and then this will kind of give you a little transition into the global thing, um, I, I talked to Pettacino and said to, said to Joe, who, by the way, still remains an extremely good friend, I said to Joe, I think the thing that will distance us from every other promotion is if we acknowledge the history of these guys and make them into legitimate athletes, by acknowledging their history and acknowledging their their collegiate background and doing things like tail of the tape and doing things like legitimizing how much they can bench press, talking about what they've done if they were an All-American in college, a legitimate All-American, uh, if they had won actual titles over in Korea, which apparently one of our guys had, and everybody always made fun of me for talking about, I'm trying to remember, who, who it was, I think it was Stephen Dane had won a Korean heavyweight championship, and uh, I, I think it was over a guy by the name of Lee Duck Sue, and uh, Scotty the Body said, yeah, I had that for dinner with an egg roll. So, uh, <laughs> Scotty the Body, by the way, went on to be Raven. Yes. Um, for those listening. And he was one of my favorite guys to have as a guest commentator. But when we when we decided we were going to do that, It scared a lot of people because they said, you're going to be talking about other federations. And I said, they're there. (laughs) There you go. And, you know, I'll I'll go one better on that. I remember there was a special report that Joe Pettacino did, and he referenced, and this was later on. I don't even know if you were still calling it at this point or not. But he did actually a special report where he reported that Bret Hart had just captured the WWF championship from Ric Flair. And I remember Mm -hmm. thinking as a fan – well, wow, that's kind of cool that 
this company, which is on ESPN, and, you know, I don't think we thought of it the way that we think of it today in ratings wars and things like that and who's number one and who's number two, but a company that is not the WWF referencing the WWF was kind of like, oh, that's kind of neat that they did that. And when Cactus Jack signed a contract with WCW and left us, we said, Cactus Jack has been a wonderful wrestler. We have had him wrestle here in this uh, area with uh, w- with World Class Championship Wrestling, with the USWA, and now with the Global Re- Wrestling Federation. He's gotten a wonderful offer with World Championship Wrestling, and we wish him the best of luck. We appreciate the time that he was here. And everybody's like, what in the hell are they doing? <laughs> yeah. And the fact is, Mick was very loyal to us and actually apologized to us for signing a contract. Mm. But the fact is, we didn't blow him off. We just said, Mick, thank you for telling us. Wow. And we treated him with respect. He treated us with respect. And to this day, you know, I, I saw Mick probably about, well, let's say about 10 years ago, and he never forgot that. Really? He said, you all always treated me with respect. And and the fact is, those were the, you know, Bill Eady was the guy that worked with us along with Joe Pettacino, and they always remembered that. I think that's why for an announcer that was only in the business a little over a year and a half, that people still within the business remember me for some reason. And that's because, A, the sportscaster mentality, and, B, I never trashed anybody. You have in, in, in the in the time I was in there, I never trashed anybody, with the exception of some of the jokes we told in the Shinonamaki post. But we, uh, the the fact was, I had a genuine affection for the business and a genuine respect for every single person I worked with, and I think the respect was mutual. That's very cool, and you know we talked a little bit of, about global, and you mentioned how you referenced the titles, but. I do have to ask you, as an announcer, the opening episodes of Global were kind of hard to comprehend what story you were trying to tell about the lineage of the company. Uh, It was meant almost to feel like it was an international company that had finally hit in the U.S., but it was mostly with U.S. guys. I mean, there was obviously the international flavor there, but for the most part, it was U.S. guys. You know, were, were you guys told to try to tell that story, or...? Yeah, it, it was it was an idea to try to make it bigger than it was, because in actuality we we had a bigger plan to begin with, and everybody has heard the the fable or the or the the myth of Olu Oliami and his and his Nigerian money and stuff. Yeah. And the fact was. Olu Oliami existed. I shook his hand in Memphis, Tennessee. The man existed. But Olu Oliami could have very easily been the guy who started every one of those letters that uh, you received in your email that said, I am a Nigerian prince. (laughs) I've actually gotten those. He was the ultimate scam artist, and he had – a lot of people close to Joe and possibly Joe as well wrapped around his finger. Wow. And he was a very shrewd con artist. Uh, and we thought we were going to have a lot more to work with than we did. And if it weren't for the Overstreet family and weren't for the mind of Bill Eady and the heart of Joe Pettacino and the syndication of Max Andrews, we wouldn't have had any global wrestling federation and they put it together with their heart and their soul and their dedication uh, to still go through with it, even though there wasn't this huge amount of money behind it. We had big dreams. We were going to do, and, and people always laugh at me when I, I say this, but we had plans to do the very first pay-per-view on an aircraft carrier. That was going to be our first pay-per-view, was on an aircraft carrier. You were going to actually do the matches on an aircraft carrier? On an aircraft carrier. And make it a that sounds awesome. Group. I salute and that, the that, was, that was how big we were dreaming. And the, the reason was my father had contact within the military. He worked in the movie production business. 
and his main job was negotiating for the movie business to use 